Right, so today we will talk about turbulence modeling. So we are almost towards the end of the course now. As I mentioned in the beginning of the course that towards the end we will be just, just touching about a certain uh, number of topics. We will not go into details of these topics as such. Okay. So today we will talk about a topic that is called turbulence modeling. And we will be particularly focusing on the modeling of turbulence using the RANS turbulence model. Okay. It is a very important topic in the sense that uh, we deal with turbulence a lot. In fact, if you think about real uh, world applications, then industrial applications particularly, most of the flows we deal with are turbulent. Okay. So first we have to understand what exactly turbulence is. Most of us do understand some sort of turbulence even if you are not in a dedicated course on turbulence. So turbulence uh, is chaotic motion. Okay, chaos by definition means that something that you cannot predict. Uh, it is irregular in the sense that uh, it does not repeat similar as uh, chaotic and it is unsteady. So if uh, we are talking about steady state situation and turbulent flows, steady state never reaches. So if you uh, for example uh, take a situation of a pipe, let us say this is a pipe or a channel in 2D and uh, there is some flow, there is a hose attached to a pump and flow enters at the inlet on the left. And you have a certain Reynolds number uh, which is defined as uh, rho times u times the length L of the channel divided by the viscosity mu of the fluid. So if we define the Reynolds number in this way uh, in this situation, then if the Reynolds number is small, I will tell you what small means, then let us say I had a probe sitting here and the probe was measuring the uh, velocity magnitude let us say and uh, my signal on my screen if the probe is uh, good enough to measure uh, very small scale fluctuations in time uh, would look like this. So this is for that laminar flow situation where the Reynolds number is small whatever that small means. Now if I start increasing the Reynolds number by increasing the flow speed at the inlet through the pump RPM. And then uh, what I will see is beyond a certain Reynolds number, uh, the signal starts to change. It starts to look, it starts to look more like uh, this now. Okay. I will start seeing fluctuations in the signal even though uh, my inlet velocity well was smooth enough. Okay. It was steady enough if I had measured the inlet flow using another probe that would actually look uh, quite uh, I mean on a different scale let us say like this. So it would look quite steady. But inside the pipe I start to see these fluctuations develop. So this is what turbulence is that you start getting chaos or some fluctuations which you cannot predict. I mean you cannot tell what will be the value of velocity at next time step. So it is chaotic. Uh, now uh, why do we care about it? We care about it because turbulent has certain properties. It causes a lot of diffusion and mixing. I mean you do that every day. You mix uh, sugar in your cup of hot tea. So when you do that you rotate it. Now rotating does not mean it is turbulent. It is creating, uh, I mean it becomes turbulent per se. What you do is you are giving it a speed. And beyond a certain speed, what happens is if you think of the cup, you are rotating it, but you do not want to mix things circumferentially, you also want to mix things radially. But what happens is because of turbulence, a radial diffusion also starts to play. So uh, the sugar would mix or whatever you are trying to mix, cream, milk, whatever, it will mix radially as well as circumferentially in all directions basically. Okay? So that velocity, if, if that creates a Reynolds number which is larger than some critical Reynolds number that results in turbulence. Now why does it happen? Because of instabilities. Okay, so beyond a certain Reynolds number, the flow becomes unstable. In the sense some sort of instabilities develop and what those mean mathematically is that even if you are, if you have a very small perturbation in the input, that results in 
amplifying the perturbation. We, we, we have learned about this, uh, the idea of instability mathematically through the von Neumann anal analysis. It is a very similar idea. Okay? Uh, small fluctuations or uh, perturbations, they amplify, they do not decay. And when they amplify, even if the inlet, because see the pump has having some rotation, there is some uh, contact with the edges and so on, it creates a very slight disturbance, a, such a slight disturbance that you cannot even measure that or see that. But those disturbances will grow with time and position inside the pipe and that will result in disturbances which are large enough for us to measure. And these disturbances typically are around 1 to 20 percent of the value of the velocity. So, if this green color is some sort of a mean, then the fluctuations will have a standard deviation which would be around 5 to 10 percent or 20 percent of that. So, this is significant disturbance that you can have, a, have a, you can um, see it in the signal. So, it creates a lot of mixing, diffusion because what is happening is if, if, you, if you see this uh, uh, signal, what we are measuring is the velocity as a function of time at a given position in space. So, uh, I mean uh, what is happening is the velocity is fluctuating. Now, if I was to plot the x velocity signal, so uh, u that will fluctuate as well. Similarly, if I had plotted the y velocity that would fluctuate as well. Now, think about what is happening in the pipe. The flow on an average is going from left to right. But we are seeing fluctuations in y velocity that is v. So, the molecules tend to jump to the layers above or below it. That is very similar to what happens in your Brownian motion that results in something called a molecular viscosity. That is what happens, right? There was a flow going at a certain speed and then a slower molecule which was glowing at a slower speed at the bottom jumped on the top layer. So, that slowed the top layer down. Similarly, the top layer would, uh, I mean, uh, if, if a reverse mechanism happens, or uh, this molecule will tend to accelerate if it goes to a faster layer. So, what is happening is momentum is being mixed because of this Brownian motion of the molecules. So, that is molecular viscosity. But in turbulence, what happens is you have a fluctuation in the, so th th there is something more than molecular motion. There is a bulk motion, but uh, I mean, th there is uh, a large scale motion but that is also resulting in diffusion because there is a fluctuation in y velocity. So, y velocity suddenly increases. So, I mean uh, if, if the average y velocity is 0 because the flow is going from left to right, the molecules have a fluctuation of, uh, let us give it a red color. So, you will see some fluctuation if you were to measure the y velocity. So, average is 0, but sometimes the molecules jump up, sometimes the molecules jump down and that results in an overall mixing as well. So, turbulence sort of creates a lot of mixing and diffusion and we know that, I mean that is very intuitive. And in fact, uh, the energy gets dissipated towards the end and that results in some heating of the fluid as well. If you have a turbulent fluid that results in some heat generation that you typically see in your motorbikes and so on. So, that is one property which is actually a good property. We tend to, uh, we, sometimes we want a good mixing in industry. You want to create uh, tablets with a mixture of different materials and you want to make sure the mixture is homogeneous. So, you can create turbulence in the system that results in a good amount of mixing, it is good. But it also has a, is a problem in certain situations like mechanical engineering in automobile engineering for example, it creates a lot of drag, turbulence results in a lot of drag. Those who have studied fluid mechanics and mechanical engineering already know that, that is the first thing you uh, say why do you study fluid mechanics because you want to measure the forces on bodies in mechanical engineering. So, it creates a lot of drag, so that is a problem. Whatever is the case, we need to model it properly and we need to characterize it. So, turbulence is a very important property and we need to focus on it uh, in particular. Right. Uh, so, as I mentioned that uh, there is uh, an instability. So, instability basically what we are saying is that beyond a certain value of uh, Reynolds number, uh, critical value, the flow uh, instabilities start to amplify and that is where turbulence starts to uh, play a role and that is that critical Reynolds number is the critical Reynolds number, Reynolds number between uh, the transition from lamina to turbulent region. In general, it is called an, uh, the subject of nonlinear dynamics where you study uh, the instabilities developing beyond a certain critical uh, property. In fluid mechanics, it is called the Reynolds number, the critical Reynolds number. 
Now uh, there is a very popular hypothesis, in fact uh, we believe it to be true uh, in uh, most situations, it's called the Kolmogorov hypothesis given by Kolmogorov, the famous uh, mathematician in the 1940s. Uh, there is always uh, discussion whether Kolmogorov gave it, the Russian mathematician or uh, the British uh, scientist called Richardson, but uh, we care about the theory, not the people who uh, proposed it. So uh, it says there is a, there's a theory called the energy cascade theory. So if you look at uh, the signal, if, if you had that one probe sitting uh, in the middle of the channel and you were measuring the signal from that probe, uh, let us say that is the u velocity as a function of time. And uh, I could do a frequency analysis of this fluctuation, right? So that will give me a frequency spectrum because any signal that fluctuates, it has a mix of frequencies. Again, we have studied the von Neumann analysis. You can do a Fourier decomposition of the signal and you can get an energy uh, spectrum where on the x axis you have some sort of uh, wave number which is uh, proportional to uh, the inverse of. Uh, your time period and then um, you have uh, the energy or the amplitude on the y axis and you may see that you have, uh, I mean if the signal was a mix of two pure frequencies you will get two peaks, but if it is a mix of many frequencies you will see that you will have some sort of uh, a signal, uh, 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 a plot like this where uh, you will see that uh, lower wave numbers have higher um, amplitude or energy and the higher wave numbers have lower energy and so on. So there is a mix of energy. Uh, so basically when we talk about spectrum uh, or wave numbers or eddies or their frequencies, basically we are talking about a signal that is fluctuating in uh, time at a given point in space. So that fluctuating signal has all the properties that any fluctuating signal has. It has a wavelength, it has a, it, it's a mix of frequencies and uh, you can think of, uh, I mean, Sometimes, uh, many a times uh, we call these eddies rather than calling them wave numbers, uh, but eddies can be a bit misleading because we are talking about a signal at a given point in space. Sometimes we think of eddies as you know rotations and each rotation has a certain frequency, but then you cannot put eddies one over the other at the same point in space. Okay? So uh, basically always remember in turbulence we are talking about a signal that is fluctuating. Okay? Uh, so any fluctuating signal will have statistical properties and those statistical properties will have some characteristics like homogeneity, isotropy and so on. Uh, so you will uh, hear about these properties, we will not go into detail of that because there will be a full fledged course in turbulence being proposed next semester, so if you are interested in that, do go for it. We just talk about things that we care about from a modeling perspective as an engineer using a CFD tool. Uh, so th there are uh, many, hypothe this hypothesis has many uh, parts to it, uh, one says that uh, the mean flow because you see that there is a mean value and there is a fluctuating part over it. Okay? Uh, so it says that the mean flow feeds energy to turbulence and the turbulence, the fluctuating parts uh, further interact with the mean flow to produce or destruct turbulence as well. And there are larger eddies or larger uh, or, or basically uh, eddies. Uh, now. Uh, I still till now I have been talking about fluctuations at a given point in space. You can also think of these fluctuations as uh, this where this is the pipe and let us say I took a picture, a snapshot of the pipe at some time. So this is, this snapshot is taken at t equal to t1. Now with that snapshot, in that snapshot if I move a, pro move a probe from left to right like this. Okay. So basically we are seeing this, we are seeing a spatial variation not a temporal variation. Experimentally what you would do is you will have to put lots of probes and you will have to see the value of that probe at a given point in time. But since we are talking hypothetically, so let us say we took a snapshot, that snapshot has the complete detail of velocity at each and every point uh, in uh, the channel and now if I plot, I have this x coordinate uh, on the x axis and on the y axis I have let us say the x velocity, I would still see some fluctuation. So these fluctuations also happen in space coordinates as well as in time and interestingly the statistical properties are very similar. Okay. So whether you see the signal in space or whether you see the signal in time. Okay. So uh, we uh, talk about eddies which are you know some things in space, so that would basically mean this kind of an idea where you are talking about a snapshot, but ultimately it is all about fluctuations, it is all about chaotic behavior in space and time. 
So what do we do? There is a fluctuation. So the most obvious thing to do is to break that into a mean. So if the fluctu if the signal looked like this, you would say that okay, I would find the average of the signal. That is the mean value. This is uh, the mean value, and the blue one, which is the fluctuating part, is a fluctuation over that. So the average of the u prime in this case will be zero. That's how you defined it. Okay. And what is the meaning of this? mean that I am talking about. In this case, it is because we are talking about a signal that is measured by a probe at a given point in space. So, that is a time average. So, what you do is you integrate whatever the function is, if it is velocity u, you call it u, the signal that you have uh, from some time from t to t plus capital T. So, basically what we are saying is if this is time t and this window is called capital T, then I will average the signal out and this is a moving average in the sense that whatever value of the mean you had have at any given time, it is an average of um, well, usually it is uh, T minus uh, capital T, but that is okay. So, it is an average of whatever the value of the signal is from that point to small t plus capital T in that window. So, that is a moving average. So, this way you can define a u bar as a function of time. Okay, so this is uh, the meaning of the averaging or the mean operator. And that's very important because ultimately we'll be taking a mean of the whole Navier-Stokes equation soon. So we must understand what is the meaning of this mean or the averaging operator. Now the question is, why are we doing all this? And the reason we're doing all this is because as engineers, uh, I am okay if I can predict my average velocities. Because see, as engineers, we want to predict velocities and pressures, right? That is the aim, ultimate aim. From there, you can calculate some, you can do post processing and you can calculate some other properties like uh, shear stresses and so on. But ultimately, you want to start with being able to predict the flow properties, the um, velocities and pressures. Now, uh, we, saw, we saw that there is a lot of fluctuation happening and uh, we will want to, uh, it's uh, predicting those fluctuations as we'll uh, discuss soon is uh, very expensive in terms of uh, computation time. So what we'll say is let's be happy with predicting the mean. It's like you are having a probe which cannot predict a lot of fluctuation. It basically averages out the signal over time and you are happy with that probe, okay? So at this stage, what we'll say is that we are happy to predict the mean values and we will uh, not worry about being able to predict the fluctuating signal. That is good enough. But how do we do that? I mean, we should be able to do it from first principles because physics, the only equation that we have, I mean, the, the only physics that we have in fluid mechanics is your Newton's second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration, which converts into a Navier-Stokes equation if you do the Eulerian analysis. So Navier-Stokes equation is your mathematical modeling, modeling equation that you have. And that Navier-Stokes equation, by the way, can uh, has all the physics in it to predict the fluctuations. In fact, it can do it. There's a, there's a method called the direct numerical simulation. So let me touch upon that before I move, because sometimes it's a bit confusing whether your Navier-Stokes model or the equation that you have can even predict those fluctuations. It can, because it has all the physics in it. In fact, there is non-linearity in the Navier-Stokes equation. Whoever, is there anyone who has done a course in non-linear dynamics? Anyone here? No, okay. So, uh, in nonlinear dynamics, we uh, basically nonlinear equations have solutions which are quite, which which can be quite chaotic. Okay. Uh, like for example, if you have a population of some uh, species and so on, so you see that if you increase the population of a, you have a prey predator uh, pre predator model, right? The Lotka Lotka Volterra equation. So, if you have some prey and some predators in a given uh, nature or closed uh, natural environment and you change the population of uh, the prey beyond a certain point, then suddenly you see the overall final um, solution basically you know, flips to a, another site. So that's called um, a bifurcation. Uh, the, a bifurcation happens and you result in a completely different solution. So uh, basically uh, nonlinear equations have a tendency to show this chaotic behavior, this um, strange uh, non-intuitive behavior and Navier-Stokes equation do the same through this idea of turbulence. So we have a non-linear term in it which is in the convective term and if you think about Reynolds number being high, Reynolds number is the ratio of your inertial effects to viscous effects. So the inertial effects are coming in this term, right? The flow, speed. So basically if the inertial effects are strong enough, that basically means your convective term is dominant enough and convective term has a non-linearity in it. 
So, the nonlinearities will start to become dominant and that will start showing this kind of uh, behavior of turbulent flow or instabilities. So, uh, but you would argue that uh, you know, in real life situations you said that uh, the incoming flow for example has a slight uh, very very small amount of fluctuation in the signal and that, is, that gets amplified. But numerically we can have a purely non-fluctuating signal. But the answer is no because you always have that small machine epsilon in your uh, values that you are dealing with. Right? By nature, I mean uh, the precision of the computer, you have a fixed precision. So, there is a small error always and that error physically can be taken analogous to that small fluctuation because of the pump or rotation or what because of the walls interaction with the walls. So, um, even if you had a delta t and delta x which were small enough to be able to resolve these signals in space and time because there are fluctuations in time and space and each, each fluctuation will have a minimum delta t associated with that because you, if you take the delta t smaller than that you will not see a full wave inside that. So, basically the spectrum has a minimum uh, or sorry, maximum frequency beyond which you are not seeing anything in space or time fluctuations. In fact, uh, those uh, frequencies and time periods are called Kolmogorov length scale, Kolmogorov time scale, Kolmogorov um, yeah, length and time scales. So, anyways, uh, so if our grid can be made small enough and delta t can be made small enough, we can resolve the turbulence and that method is called direct numerical simulation, DNS, you may have heard of it as well. But that is very expensive and you cannot do a DNS on an industrial equipment because that will take forever because your grid size and delta t are extremely small. So, as engineers we are not happy with that method because it cannot be used to give anything realistic for us. Anyways, uh, so where do we go? We will be happy with predicting the mean velocities, we do not care about the fluctuations, at least not predicting the fluctuations. But for predicting mean velocities, we need to have an equation for mean velocities because the Navier-Stokes equation is for actual velocity which contains both u bar and u prime. So, what do we do? Well, mathematics. So, what you say is you have your Navier-Stokes equation here where your u is given as a sum of u bar and u prime. Similarly, if I look at p, p is given as a sum of p bar and p prime. So, I will substitute that into the equation, the Navier-Stokes equation and when you do that, you get lots of terms and then you say I will take an average of the whole equation. Averaging means this operator. It is not that difficult to do. In fact, for an undergraduate course we show it in the class. In fact, uh, you can refer to my recorded lectures on fluid mechanics where in an undergraduate class we show the complete derivation, but here we do not have time for that. So, when you do that you get this equation. It looks very similar to the equation that you started with, the original Navier-Stokes equation, but you have an extra term. And this uh, makes us conclude that the mean velocity has a contribution from the fluctuations. So, if I am trying to predict the mean velocity, if I am trying to develop a model of the mean velocity in the flow the fluctuations affect that mean velocity, the nature of fluctuations. So, the fluctuations sort of produce some mean flow, fluctuation is this fluctuation over the mean, but those fluctuations they, they uh, interact with each other and they result in either decreasing or increasing the mean flow with time. So, if you completely neglected the fluctuation by saying that you know what I will, uh, I will assume the flow is laminar. I simply increase the velocity of the flow. Then you are not solving the correct equation, the physics that you will get will be incorrect. Okay? But the question is uh, how do we deal with this now because we want to get rid of u primes from the equation completely. That is where modeling comes. So, in modeling what we do is uh, now, now we intuitively know that turbulence creates mixing, it creates a lot of diffusion and diffusion is very similar to the molecular diffusion. right? We just now talked about the fact that turbulence is fluctuation, fluctuation results in molecules jumping all over the place around it and that results in a mixing of mass, momentum and energy. So, in my Navier-Stokes equation the mixing or the diffusion is modeled from the using the diffusion term. So, it makes sense to model this very similar to the way we model the 
diffusion term or the shear stress term in the Navier Stokes equation. So, that is where we bring in um, the hypothesis that is called the Businesk hypothesis. The Businesk hypothesis says that this term that you have here, in fact, not the whole thing, this thing. Uh, is called the Reynolds stress. Sometimes there is also a rho attached with it uh, since we are talking about incompressible flows here. So, we will just divide everything by rho. So, this u prime u prime bar with a negative sign it is called Reynolds stress and the, they are not any the, there is nothing physical about these stresses. It is just that we got an extra term in the mean momentum equation when we did the Reynolds averaging of the momentum equation or the navier stokes equation and that term is something we call the Reynolds stress. In fact, the averaging operator is called the Reynolds um, averaging. So that is the reason it is called a Rance equation, Reynolds average navier stokes. Okay? So, that was proposed by Reynolds, so we call it Reynolds averaging. And this decomposition into a mean and fluctuating part is called a Reynolds decomposition. Okay? You will you'll read these terms in your software and so on. So, how do we model this? That is a closure problem because if you are trying to uh, close your set of equations mathematically, um, you cannot, I mean, you can use your Navier Stokes and uh, substitute this in terms of other fluctuating terms, but that creates a closure problem. Okay? So, we need to close this equation. So we need to find a model for the Reynolds stresses. And that is as I said is uh, where we use the Business hypothesis. Now, since it is a it, turbulence acts like a diffusion in your equation. So, it makes sense to model this the way the same way we model the shear stresses which cause the viscous diffusion or the momentum diffusion. In shear in in, uh, in the actual stresses the shear stresses in your uh, fluid mechanics when you derive the Navier Stokes equation you have the divergence of your shear stress tau. And that is modeled using this um, this, this uh, viscosity hypothesis where you say that this is the shear stress is proportional to the uh, gradients of velocity. Uh, um, and the similar way we say that the Reynolds stress is proportional to the gradients of mean velocity. Okay. Uh, and the proportionality constant is called a uh, uh, eddy diffusivity or turbulent diffusivity or turbulent viscosity or eddy viscosity. So, it is basically we are saying it is like a viscosity, but it is a turbulent viscosity and usually it is much larger than molecular viscosity because um, turbulence creates a mixing which is much larger in magnitude than molecular mixing. It is like you are you have you put cream or uh, milk in your uh, coffee and you slowly rotate it, you will see that the cream sort of forms these layers. Okay. Molecular viscosity is still acting, but it is very slow, you do not see that layers mixing. But if you increase the speed and you create turbulence, suddenly everything mixes. That is because the, um, the amount of uh, diffusion or uh, the mixing associated or the viscosity associated with turbulence is orders of magnitude higher than molecular viscosity. Okay. But there is a difference, this molecular viscosity is homogeneous. It is not that in a flow you will see the viscosity is different here and different here. It is the same everywhere. But in turbulence, the, the turbulent viscosity is a function of space and time. Because if in a region of space you have more turbulence, like you let us say you, you switch on a fan in this room, some corners in the room may not have any turbulence at all. Whereas region close to the fan will have a lot of turbulence. So, the viscosity, the turbulent viscosity near the fan will be much hard, larger than the turbulent viscosity near the corners in the room. Okay? So, this viscosity, so you cannot take it out from the divergence term, you have to be careful with that. But the question is, okay, so what now? Now that we have written this term in terms of this, there is still something that is unknown, that is the turbulent viscosity. How do we deal with that? So, for that there are different models proposed. So, the most popular one is called the k epsilon model. In the k epsilon model, we use the turbulence kinetic energy, it is like you know half mv square divided by m, so it is um, half v square, but instead of having the mean velocity, it is the v squared or the fluctuations or the u prime u prime bar. Here we are using Einstein notation, so this expands to half of u prime u prime bar plus v prime v prime bar 
plus w prime w prime bar. So this is uh, like uh, typically you would say half m v square where v is the magnitude so v square becomes u square plus v square plus w square but these uh, are for fluctuating square of fluctuating terms the average of that okay. So this is called the turbulent kinetic energy it sort of tells you how much of a kinetic energy you have in terms from the fluctuating terms and then you have uh, uh, some, something called uh, the dissipation or the rate of dissipation uh, strictly speaking rate of dissipation of the turbulent kinetic energy that is called epsilon and using this k and epsilon um, again uh, we cannot go into detail of that uh, you can write your turbulent viscosity in terms of k and epsilon. So everything now boils down to finding k and epsilon so we are increasing our problem now right but we will soon be able to close things down. So uh, this turbulent kinetic energy and rate of turbulent dissipation they change they vary with space and time. So if they vary with space and time then nu t the turbulent viscosity will also vary with space and time right. So when solving the equations we have to solve for two more equations in turbulent uh, flows in the k epsilon model first we solve for the evolution of the turbulent kinetic energy and then we solve for the evolution of the turbulent dissipation rate. How we get these equations is immaterial we can you can get k, the k equation from the Navier-Stokes equation uh, by doing some mathematical manipulation and epsilon is basically uh, motivated from the form of k. So uh, let us look at how these equations look mathematically there is a, a transient term there is a convective term so k is your phi in your common form that we have talking about we have been talking about there is a term everything here is taken into your source term and there is a diffusive term. So it looks exactly similar to the common form that we have dealt with. So if you have a software if you have developed a software that can solve this common form you can solve your k and epsilon equations as well quite easily it is not that difficult to solve it is just that it takes longer because you are solving extra number of equations and each equation has its own nonlinearities we have to iterate inside the equation as well. So what do we have now? We have our mean momentum equation that requires an additional term called turbulent viscosity which is obtained from solving the k and epsilon equation. So you have to solve two more equations now k equation and epsilon equation once you solve that you calculate nu t turbulent viscosity you substitute that into your uh, Rans or the mean momentum equation or the uh, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation and from that you can predict your u bar v bar and w bar and that is and p bar and that is the aim right. We also have to take care of the boundary conditions so uh, for the walls where you have strictly no slip that means the u and v and w are 0 so that means there is no velocity no fluctuation so uh, k and epsilon are taken as 0 or near 0 on the walls. But for free stream or inlet I said that at the inlet you have fluctuations. So how do we figure out what the fluctuations are? Well there are different ways one is you can take some sort of an intensity so intensity basically means that if you have a signal which is fluctuating like this then there is an average and there is a standard deviation. So that standard deviation you can say that the standard deviation of the signal is 5 percent of mean. So if this is uh, well this was the origin so this is the uh, magnitude of your u bar then the uh, u standard deviation is going to be this and this is going to be 5 percent of this if that is what you mean uh, that that is what you have in the inflow. So that depends on your inflow properties so typically we just put it as between 5 or 10 percent uh, as a turbulence intensity and that uh, helps us define what is um, the fluctuations u prime v prime and w prime and from there you can calculate the turbulent kinetic energy which is given in terms of u prime v prime and w prime similarly you can calculate dissipation rate using that as well. So this is how we specify uh, boundary condition at the outflow at the outlet we can simply say that there is a Neumann boundary condition that there is a uh, the del so at the outlet we can say del k by del n where n is the uh, normal direction in the outflow direction this is 0 and we can also say del epsilon by del n is equal to 0 so that is the standard thing we do for outflow boundary conditions. Uh, there is something else that we have to care about they are called the wall functions 
because uh, in turbulence what happens is, uh, I mean if you think of the boundary layer, and remember turbulence, uh, if I actually go back and show you this term, this is called the production term. This results in production of turbulent kinetic energy. And here you can see that there is a del by del x of or uh, basically the spatial gradient of the average of the mean velocity. So what happens is the mean velocity gradient results in fluctuations and fluctuating terms feed to mean. So there are, uh, the fluctuating terms and the mean terms are interacting with each other. So here the mean velocity in a turbulent la boundary layer you will see a velocity uh, mean velocity varying like this with y. So there is a mean velocity gradient that one, ha one has to uh, understand or one has to um, predict. But that change happens in a very small region. So to be able to resolve that velocity gradient, you would need a mesh which is extremely fine. And that actually that minimum uh, mesh size depends on your Kolmogorov length scale, which is inversely proportional to your Reynolds number. So the higher Reynolds number, the smaller, the finer the mesh you need near the boundary. So that results in very expensive solution near the boundary. So uh, to manage that, we deal with something called wall functions. Again, this topic is discussed in your undergraduate fluid mechanics. We basically empirically we have studied how does the velocity vary in the near the wall region in a turbulent boundary layer. And we use some sort of an empirical fit like a linear fit uh, in the viscous uh, laminar region or a logarithmic fit in the uh, inner and the outer layers. So if you use, if you assume the velocity to be varying logarithmically, uh, logarithmically with the uh, uh, term y, they are non-dimensional, there is a u plus and y plus which are non-dimensionalized non form of uh, x velocity u and the y component, you will get some sort of a fit. So basically rather than predicting the flow velocity near the boundary, you sort of use a standard fit fitting term. So then you do not need to have your mesh small enough near the boundary. Okay. Any questions till now? Now very quickly I can demonstrate I can demonstrate to you uh, in ANSYS fluent how do you model turbulence. So I already have set up a case, I will simply um, run that case and demonstrate that for you. It will take some time to set up the virtual machine. In the meantime, are there any questions? So today's lecture is quite a, uh, a lot of stuff in it, but I had to discuss this uh, because it is important to be able to talk about turbulence. But in the end, you have to, yes. No, you do not set y plus, y plus is basically your y divided by, uh, it is a non-dimensionalized form uh, which includes uh, like the wall shear stress uh, in it. So basically you do not set it, y plus you are saying that uh, when your y plus is between certain range, then you will be using a certain model. So basically what happens is you are trying to predict your velocities, right. So you do, so there is a, there is a, there is a boundary, there is one grid cell and then you have another grid cell. You are predicting the values on the nodes of the grid cell. But what happens between that region? We use some sort of an interpolation usually. We say that is a linear interpolation, quadratic interpolation and so on. But in that boundary region cell, you are saying that the flow varies like a logarithmic, uh, the interpolation is logarithmic, that is what you are saying. So you do not predict uh, the, rather than resolving the flow inside the boundary layer, you use some sort of a um, log behavior in the first cell. Now typically that first cell is taken between, sorry? Let us discuss after the class. Are you doing something with uh, turbulence? Yes, so we will discuss it after the class. Okay. I do really want to demonstrate uh, this thing in the next 5 minutes. I already have set up an, uh, a project, I am simply opening that and demonstrating that to you.
So I've set up a geometry, I've set up a mesh. Uh, let me simply go to the um, um, setup of the problem. And uh, then I'll show you the geometry and mesh in Fluent. So this is our uh, this fluent window. So that's the same problem that we had discussed in the very first tutorial in this course. We have flow happening in a channel, but at the center of the channel, you have a circular cylinder. So it's like a flow past a circular cylinder, and we expect the flow to show some sort of uh, a wake region behind the cylinder. Now, typically, I would take the outer region to be much further away from the cylinder. It's a toy problem. I don't care about that. Okay. Um, the mesh in this case, I have taken an unstructured mesh rather than a structured mesh. In the tutorial problem, we had taken a square grid. Here, we have taken a triangular grid. Grid, and near the surface of the cylinder, I have refined the grid a bit further because uh, I would want to resolve the pressure and velocity, the mean velocity and the mean pressure, uh, in a better sense. If I take a coarse grid, then uh, it's not able to resolve those things accurately. That results in a an in a inaccurate solution as well. So what do you do? Uh, typically in models you would see that you would go to viscous and set up a laminar model, but this time we are using a k epsilon model. Let us say uh, I had, well let's solve for the k epsilon first. And then uh, for the boundary conditions, at the inlet I have a velocity inlet situation. So where you specify your inlet velocity magnitude, so in this case it is 10,000 meters per second, it's a hypothetical case. And um, since we are using a k epsilon model, we have to specify what is the turbulence intensity. So the intensity is 5% and then you also, uh, um, that helps us figure out uh, what are the k and epsilon values at the inlet. Then you have outlet which is a standard pressure outlet. So you specify, it's a, it's a Dirichlet for pressure and the Neumann for velocity and the walls are typically no slip walls in this case. That's pretty much it and uh, then it already knows that you have switched on the k epsilon model, so it will solve those equations as well. And then uh, I go to run, run calculation. Well, before that, uh, we go to methods. And in methods, uh, now these things will start making sense. The scheme is simple. We talked about simple scheme in this course. Uh, the, the gradients, uh, well, spatial gradients, remember the least squared method for predicting the gradients in that one lecture on unstructured, unstructured meshes, the least squares method. So that's one. There are, I was trying to discuss the green gauss uh, method as well, but then the time was up. So th these are, these methods are available in uh, standard ANSYS Fluent and other software. We use a, a second order discretization for pressure, momentum, this time we are using second order uplift. So you'll see that you tend to use higher order schemes, not lower order schemes. Then you have some schemes to be chosen for turbulent kinetic energy and turbulent dissipation rate. So you're using first order, you can also use second order um, quick scheme or the muscle scheme. And then the transient formulation. So typically we tend to use first order um, Euler scheme, but here we are using a second order implicit scheme in this case. We have not, never discussed about second order implicit schemes in this course, but they are available as well. Okay, so you choose these schemes. Um, usually you'll let them be to the default values. Uh, before trying to play around with that. Then I have to choose uh, time step. In this case, it's very difficult to predict the right time step. So what we say is that it's a CFL based adaptive time step. So what that means is uh, the software will figure out by itself by calculating the CFL number and figure out wherever the CFL of the current number is greater than one, it will try to I mean, it will try to maintain the maximum current number below a certain value. In this case, I am saying keep it below 10. And now I simply start running it, so I say calculate, uh, I didn't initialize it, so it's initialized as uh, a solution by itself and now it starts plotting the um, residuals, all of you know what residuals mean by now, right, we talked about iterative methods, so you know exactly what a residual is and what happens to a residual when your steady state has reached or when you have converged, it's zero, right. Now uh, in 
while uh, seeing the plot of residuals, I don't know if you can see that, but you see that it, let, let's stop it actually, I don't need to run it for a very long time. If you look at the residuals here, you see that uh, they increase and then they start decreasing. And then they increase and they start decreasing. Why do you think this is happening? Residuals are supposed to go down with iterations. Why is it that they are increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing? Time step, exactly. So what's happening is that within a time step, you're solving Ax equal to b, right? So in that Ax equal to b, you start with some initial guess, which is the previous time step value. And then your residuals, you're solving Ax equal to b. So residuals are supposed to go down with gauss idle iterations. Once you find the solution, you start the next time step. So you start with a bad guess for the next time step. So in the, on the x axis, it shows iterations, but that's a bit confusing because they are iterations, yes. But iterations finish, next time step starts, but they don't differentiate. But you can see that the residuals are showing this, okay. So uh, you would expect this behavior. There's nothing unexpected here. But with time, the residual, I mean, they should go down if they stay constant. And time steps also, if you are, if you have some sort of a steady state behavior, you would see that your overall residuals on an average will also go down. But if your solution is completely uh, turbulent, let's say uh, transient, then you would see that the residuals will keep showing this behavior. And this is uh, the magnitude, and you can also plot. velocity vectors. We didn't solve it for a very long time. So we can't see, but you can see that there is some sort of recirculation that has started to develop in this region. And with time, you will see that the recirculation size will increase and the vortices will start shedding and so on. Now the thing is, uh, what if I had tried to solve the problem as a laminar problem in this case? Because I, I was, uh, I never calculated Reynolds number, let's say. I simply solved the problem with the same velocity as a laminar problem. What do you think will happen? Those with experience can probably answer that question better. Have you tried solving your turbulent problem taking a laminar model? It will diverge in most cases. Because see, if you think of the Navier-Stokes equation, you have a diffusive term. So turbulent, basically what is turbulence doing? It is adding some more diffusion, some more viscosity. And viscosity diffusion tends to stabilize the problem, right? Viscous problems are very stable. Convective problems can become unstable in, uh, in nature. So, uh, well, in, in uh, numerics. So uh, adding diffusion always stabilizes the problem. Right, uh, so where were we? So, uh, basically what happens is if you switch, if you do not switch on a turbulence model, you're trying to solve for a problem where your convection is much larger than what you would have expected. And because you don't have that stabilizing term, that should be in nature in reality. Because see, you're talking about unstable situations. Beyond critical Reynolds number, you have instabilities. So uh, those instabilities are supposed to be controlled by adding that diffusive term and calling it a mean uh, flow um, prob uh, solution. So if you don't switch on the, uh, switch on the diffusion, ter diffusion terms, you would see that numerically your problem would go out of bounds. So that's a very standard check that people do. They don't even calculate Reynolds number. If they are, it's difficult to calculate in that situation, you slowly increase the Reynolds number. And then you see how your uh, solutions are behaving and you would see that when you start going deeper into the uh, uh, turbulent region and you're still using, uh, using a laminar flow solver, your solution would diverge. You run it, it says out of bounds, floating one exception, some error like that. So then uh, that is when you realize that you should, that the flow is actually getting turbulent, you have to switch on the stabilizing diffusion terms due to the turbulence models and then you will see the solution will start behaving itself. So that was a very short lecture on turbulence modeling. I hope you were able to get something out of it. Now, those who have a, a question regarding uh, modeling turbulence, and turbulence is a beast when it's when you're modeling it. Um, one is supposed to uh, expect it to get confused. There were the three uh, very good references. One is uh, a book on turbulence modeling for CFD by Wilcox. 
everybody who is doing any CFD with turbulence should have this book at their desk. Uh, Wilcox was the one who proposed the K omega model, there are many other models available which is very similar to K epsilon model but uh, that person has written a very nice book uh, on turbulence modeling in general, definitely have that. Then uh, to understand turbulent flows in general properly you should have this book by Stephen Pope and uh, there are a couple of chapters uh, on turbulence in uh, a fluid mechanics book by um, Kundu and Cohen, so you should definitely have a look at that as well if you want to understand the derivation and the uh, properties of turbulent flows in fluid mechanics in general. Okay? So these three books are very good for understanding turbulence from modeling perspective in general, there are in many other books available. Right? Uh, so in the next lecture, now this was uh, a demo slash lecture, in the next lecture on Thursday, so this week we are all having demos and uh, associated with lectures. So on Thursday, I will demonstrate multi-phase flows to you. That is another topic that people will see a lot. So I will talk about for the first half an hour, I will talk about multi-phase flow equations. And in the next uh, 20 minutes, I will demonstrate how to solve that using uh, an FEM solver called fluidity. Now I could have demonstrated that in ANSYS Fluent as well, but I also want to use that lecture for demonstrating another open source code called fluidity. So there are different codes that uh, handle things differently. It is worth having an, uh, an overview of different codes so that you can choose whichever one is the most efficient for you. Okay? And uh, I think we will have two more lectures after that. So, um, so there is no new heavy content as such, just these uh, demonstration slash lectures in the next. And towards the end, the next uh, week we will have one lecture I think. For that we will simply summarize the whole course and I will answer, answer any questions that you may have regarding evaluations and so on. Okay?